that so though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Isn't it marvelous to know that we have a God who cares so much for us that he will never forsake us? He promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What a great and precious promise indeed that is to us who have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The message today entitled, What a Father Should Teach His Sons. It's Father's Day. What a marvelous, wonderful thought. I always enjoy Father's Day. I look with gratitude and thanksgiving at the children that God has given to me. Some have learned the lessons that I have taught. Some are still learning. I wonder if some will ever learn some of the lessons that I've tried to teach. And I suspect that every one of us who are sons or daughters have failed to learn some of the lessons that our parents have tried diligently to teach us. Or perhaps we've learned lessons that they should not have taught us. We'll be talking about some of those today. Things where fathers have failed to teach the correct things. They have taught instead the ways of the world, instead of teaching the ways of God. Now, obviously, we cannot cover the entire book of Proverbs today, which is designed, as we read just a few moments ago, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. The ornament of grace is it will make you beautiful in the sight of God. <laughs> chains about your neck means it will restrain you from doing things that will hurt you or hurt others or bring shame to the name of Christ for glory and for restraint. If you learn the book of Proverbs, you learn how to live a life that is pleasing to God. And a father is instructing his son in this book. The book of Proverbs is designed to teach immature, foolish, selfish, hormone-driven boys how to become wise, self-controlled, godly men. In the process, it also teaches girls and parents how to choose the right kind of wise men for their daughters to marry. That's important. It also teaches both boys and girls how to avoid wrong life choices that end in sorrow and destruction. Three chapters, for example, are given to the wicked woman and what she's like and what to avoid so that you don't become like her and so that you don't be seduced by her. Proverbs chapters 5, 6, and 7. Now, as we look at the book of Proverbs, perhaps the best thing to do is first get an overview of how it is put together. A lot of people look at it and they say it doesn't make any sense. It bounces from one idea to another idea. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason or harmony or structure to the book of Proverbs. That's wrong. The book of Proverbs is very carefully structured and very carefully designed. Let me show you. Proverbs has four major divisions, and each of those four major divisions within the division covers four basic areas of instruction. The four divisions are, first of all, chapters 1 through 9. It's what I like to call, and I came up with this idea back in the early days of computers, and you know how little I know about computers. So those of you who are technical geeks, please forgive my ignorance in the way in which I compare this to those old gigantic computers like the IBM computers that filled entire rooms and couldn't do what your laptop does today. But as I looked at the book of Proverbs and I started studying this back when I was in early high school, it seems to me that it comprises the first nine chapters comprises the hardware or the framework around which all the latter specific details of instruction are grouped. The rest of the book is set up like software programs that fit the framework established in chapters 1 through 9. And the first section begins with some key divisional words. You're going to see these key divisional words introducing each of the four sections of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 1.1, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. 
he tells you the Proverbs of Solomon. That is a phrase that's going to break up the book into some sections. We'll see that in just a second. The second major division of the book of Proverbs is chapters 10 through 24. These are specific Proverbs given by Solomon, some of which Solomon learned from David, and he says so as you go through. So David was really the first one to start teaching these principles to Solomon. Solomon is the wise son who codified everything, but many of these Proverbs were taught to Solomon by David, and we'll discover that some of the Proverbs were also taught to Solomon by Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. But we find chapters 10 through 24, the general overview is given in chapters 1 through now. Now specific details follow in chapter 10 for 24 for specific life situations. When you get into this situation, what do you do? When you get into that situation, what do you do? What's the right response to that particular life situation? That's what you have in these chapters 10 through 24. We're put on notice that chapter 10 begins the specific individual Proverbs, again in verse 1, by the same divisional words that started chapter 1 and the first division. Proverbs 10.1 says, The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. That brings us to the third division of the book of Proverbs, which is chapters 25 through 30. Chapters 25 through 30 is the third major division of the book of of Proverbs. These are Proverbs that were taken. Now listen carefully. Did you know that Proverbs and Ecclesiastes were not the only books that Solomon wrote? We find that out in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 1. These Proverbs were taken from the judicial, administrative, and other writings of Solomon that were culled out of Solomon's writings in the days of Hezekiah. That section also specifically separates these verses out by its opening verse, Proverbs 25, 1. These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. They didn't copy them from former chapters. They copied them out of other things. Solomon was a king. Solomon worked probably a, a 16 or 18 hour day every day. And he was having court matters going on and he was having all kinds of other international matters going on. And he was certainly having a lot of weddings going on. He, he, had, he had put down a whole lot of stuff. And the men of Hezekiah sat down and went through it. When you look at the ancient libraries of the ancient world, and some of them are still extant, where there are thousands and thousands and thousands of clay tablets of all the things that were going on, Hezekiah said, you know, Solomon was a wise king. We need to go through, we need to go through all of the stuff that we have still extant from Solomon's reign and we need to find his wisdom there and put it all together. It says so in chapter 25, verse 1. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. That brings us to the fourth and final division of the book of Proverbs, which is chapter 31. It's a fascinating chapter. It is the capstone chapter of wisdom for the book because it deals with the woman God's man will marry. The crown of creation was Eve, the woman that God brought to Adam. She's the one that made him complete. Oh, yes, we know about the fall. But there was not a, another creature that was fit for Adam. So all through the book of Proverbs, he's dropped some hints about what a godly woman will be like. And he's given you massive sections about what the ungodly woman is like. Well, we get to chapter 31, and we discover the woman a man marries makes all the difference in whether or not his life will be a success in the eyes of God. This chapter is God's teaching about the godly woman that Solomon learned from his mother Bathsheba. But Bathsheba is not the example, although she was an extremely wise woman, being the daughter of Ahithophel, who was David's wisest counselor, granddaughter, prior to his adultery with Bathsheba. 
Bathsheba was an adulteress, but she was Solomon's mother. Instead, Bathsheba principally used Solomon's great-grandmother, Ruth, as the example of the godly woman. This final section is introduced at the end of chapter 30 by some what have been called enigmatic and prophetic words about the word of God, both the written word and the living word. That's what sort of separates chapter 31 off from the rest of the book of Proverbs. But this section also has an official introduction that is strikingly different than the other three sections. Chapter 31, verse 1. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. All the rest of those divisions said the Proverbs of Solomon. The words of King Lemuel, he uses a, a, a name of endearment here, a name that his mom called him by. And these are not things that David taught him. These are not things that he came up with on his own. They're things that his mother taught him. Notice also here the words are called a prophecy, not a set of proverbs like in the other three divisions. Prophetically, this section tells you in advance what kind of life a man will have who marries the right kind of woman. It prophetically tells you what kind of life a man will have who marries the right kind of woman in contrast to the man who marries the wrong kind of woman warned against in all the rest of the book of Proverbs. Most men are attracted to a woman by their hormones, not by their spirit. It's sad that that's the way men are made. And if that's what attracts you to a woman, you're done for, guys. And all the way through the book of Proverbs, God speaking through David and Solomon and Bathsheba, giving illustrations, tells you what will it be like for the man who marries the wrong kind of woman. What will it be like for the man who marries the right kind of woman? And so we have in the fourth and final division of the book of Proverbs, really the capstone to all of the rest of the principles that we find in the book of Proverbs, because the wife will either support the principles of the word of God and encourage her husband in that way, or else she will deny and attack him and undercut him and undermine him and frazzle him to death into violation of those principles. Solomon was wise. He knew that. He himself had many wicked women for wives, and it says they turned his heart from serving the Lord, and he ended up sacrificing his own children by those wives to pagan gods. We'll read that verse in just a little bit. He's telling you what he knows from experience. He's explaining what kind of woman you want to avoid. And so, girls, if you want to be the kind of woman that a godly man will want to marry, learn what the godly man has to avoid and flee from that yourself and become like the woman that God describes in the book of Proverbs. It's a father teaching a son, but it's applicable both to boys and girls as they learn what God has to say on that most intimate of all human relationships, which affects every other area of life. It does. So those are the four major divisions of the book of Proverbs. Now within those four divisions, there are four basic areas of instruction and application. Four divisions, four areas of instruction and application. And by the way, note very well that there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. As you go through the book of Proverbs, it talks sometimes about knowledge and sometimes it talks about wisdom. The accumulation of knowledge is a presupposition for all four of those different areas of instruction. It assumes that you've done your homework. It assumes that you have gathered the information so that you have something to work with. God does not work in a vacuum. 
He does not give you new special revelation, a bolt out of the blue. He expects you to know the content so that then he can take the content and show you how to apply the content to specific life situations. Wisdom deals with the application of facts. Knowledge deals with facts, but wisdom deals with the application of facts. In other words, Solomon assumes through most of the book that the boy, his son, has done his homework and has learned the facts. But raw facts are not the key issue in Proverbs. Even an idiot and a fool can know raw facts. And he talks about some of the fools who know the facts, but they don't know what to do with the facts. Proverbs assumes that the young man will have learned the facts. Facts are the stuff of which knowledge is composed. But the question in Proverbs is, how do you interpret, how do you use, and how do you apply the facts to real life situations? That's wisdom. That's what Solomon is trying to impart to his son. That's what a father should be imparting to both his sons and his daughters is wisdom. Even the wisest man on earth, who is Solomon, can have a fool for a son who has failed to learn what his father taught him. Those of you who know who the history of Israel know that the man who followed Solomon on the throne was Rehoboam. Rehoboam was Solomon's son. Solomon had some wiser sons than Rehoboam. But you see, because of what Solomon had done with his multiple wives, God specifically cursed him by told, telling him, I won't jerk the kingdom out of your hand, but I'm going to take it away during your son's reign. And a servant of yours is going to become king and take some of the tribes with him. And that was Jeroboam the first, one of Solomon's servants, a diligent man. And he got the ten northern kingdom, the ten northern tribes to follow him and they established the kingdom of Israel and the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, stayed with Rehoboam and that was called Judah. And so you have the period of the divided kingdom with the ten northern kingdoms, uh, ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes in two different kingdoms going on and that northern group never had a good king. All those kings turned away from God. Southern kingdom had a few good kings and so they lasted a little longer. Northern kingdom was taken into captivity in 722 by Sennacherib, king of Assyria. But Sennacherib attacked Jerusalem and the angel of the Lord killed 186,000 of them overnight. That, that was during the days of Isaiah because the general had mocked the God of Israel. So God said, I'll teach him a lesson. Sennacherib went home and while he was bowing before his own God, Nisroch, in his own temple, in his own town, two of his sons, Adram, Melech, and Sherezer, killed him in front of his own God. That God couldn't take care of him. But finally... Judah also had its fall. 605 B.C., 597 B.C., and 586 B.C., three times Nebuchadnezzar sacked the city of Jerusalem. Yes, a wise man can have a fool for a son, one who does not learn what his father tried to teach. Just being a wise man does not guarantee that your children will learn what they are supposed to learn. You see, within the first week of his reign, Rehoboam split the kingdom because he listened to fools who were his own age, his friends, rather than listening to the older wise men who had sat under the teaching of his father. So the four basic areas of instruction in wisdom are laid out in Proverbs 1.3. Notice the three things, the three of these deal with areas specifically related to leadership, to law, and to principles of ruling, as well as general areas of life. You can apply them in general areas. But three of the four deal with what it means to be a king, what it means to be a ruler, what it means to be a lawgiver. A man who understands these areas will be a divinely qualified leader in every sphere of authority, in the family, in the church, at work, and in government. These principles are contrary, by the way, to the principles of the world. Proverbs 1.3, here they are. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, that's law, judgment, that is a king's responsibility when he makes decisions, and equity, which is not playing favorites. 
wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. Wisdom, learning to apply God's divine perspective to the facts to get God's results on life issues. Justice, learning to apply God's standard of righteousness to every fact pattern. God is not fair, God is righteous. God is not fair, God is just. That's what justice is all about. Judgment, learning how to see past the smoke screens that people put up. Have you ever been in a conversation and you knew the person was trying to deceive you? Have you ever been there? You, you, you sense that something wasn't quite right in what they were telling you. Judgment is learning how to see past those smoke screens that people put up so that you can understand the real facts in every case and be able to tell right from wrong. Equity. That means to apply equal standards to every person in every situation of life so that you don't end up playing favorites and cutting deals for people you like while coming down hard on the people you don't like. That's what Proverbs is involved with. Here's a young man that Solomon is trying to train for leadership. Every father wants to train his sons to go farther than he has gone. Every father wants to train his daughters to do better than he. That brings us to the third thing for the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs has at least 21 different areas of life, that's three times seven, rather interesting, to which those four areas of instruction are laid out. 21 different areas of life to which these four areas of instruction are laid out. When a young man learns God's ways in these areas, he is well on his way to maturity, proper leadership in the home, proper leadership in the church, proper leadership at work, proper leadership in society. And when a young man really learns those things, he's ready for marriage and fulfilling God's goals for his life. Not his goals, God's goals for his life. Now, obviously, we can't cover everything. But perhaps we can give a brief overview to show that a father has a huge job to pass all of his wisdom to the next generation. And fathers who fail to do that mean that the next generation, and I think we're living in one of those generations, when fathers fail to pass these 21 different areas of life, God's wisdom in those areas, when they fail to do that, it's a generation that collapses and the nation collapses. The principal 21 different areas of life covered by wisdom in this father-to-son talk include, number one, friends, right and wrong, areas of danger that alert you to the type of friends that they are and why you need to avoid them. That's number one. Number two, wise use of money, God's principles versus worldly principles. Number three, the wise use of material goods and resources for eternal purposes. Number four, integrity. These are the, the 21 different categories that he deals with, with lots of different illustrations. Integrity, which covers honesty, truthfulness, reliability, strength against compromise, and so on. Number five, knowing and doing God's will. In other words, how to have a right relationship with God. If you don't teach that to your kids, you're in trouble, and they're in really big trouble. How to know and do the will of God. I won't spend a lot of time on that today because I have done a whole series on how to know the will of God. Number six, the wise use of skills that God has given you. The wise use of skills that God has given you. There are a lot of verses in the book of Proverbs that cover issues related to diligent work. What are you supposed to do with the talent God has given you? Number seven, major area in the book of Proverbs, the wise use of time. The wise use of time. Number eight, major area of life, control of the tongue. A lot of details about the control of the tongue in the book of Proverbs. Number nine, accountability versus excuse making. I am so tired of excuse makers, people who give excuses for this and that and the other thing. Book of Proverbs says, you know, you're supposed to communicate to your children the ability and the courage to say, I was wrong. I'm not going to make an excuse. I didn't fulfill the obligation or the responsibility that I was supposed to have. I'll try to do better. And I'll go back and do what I was supposed to do and didn't get it done. Accountability versus excuse making. 
Number 10, life perspective, or what we call today a world view. A father is supposed to communicate to his children a Christian world view. We are so inundated by the media today that we have almost totally forgotten what it means to have a Christian world view. That's the job of a father, to teach his children a Christian world view. You can go into most churches today and nobody has the foggiest idea of what it means to have a Christian world view. That's Proverbs. The world view is helping you to understand what is important from God's viewpoint and what is valuable from God's viewpoint and what is not important and what is not valuable. Where's your focus? Father's supposed to teach his children that. And then the seven deadly sins, we've covered each one of these individually, so I'll not spend a lot of time on it today. But there are seven key categories of sins that Solomon deals with in the book of Proverbs. Pride versus humility. Greed versus generosity. Anger versus forgiveness. Sloth versus diligence. Envy versus kindness. Gluttony versus self-control and lust versus love. That's numbers 11 through 17 of these 21 things. Lust versus love, that's the passage he spends, that's the one he spends really a lot of time on. The issues of sex and evil women and good women and how to choose a wife and marriage and moral purity. He spends a lot of time on that. Young people, don't skip those sections. It tells you how your relationship is supposed to be while you're single. And after you're married, moral purity is God's standard all the way up to the wedding night. Number 18, attitudes and motives, both good and bad. There are many of them dealt with in Proverbs. We can't cover them all today, but I'm at least listing it for you. Number 19, fools. <laughs> The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about fools. And did you know that although we're using one word in English, fools, there are multiple different words for different kinds of fools in the book of Proverbs. Oh, yes. Uh, God looks down and he categorizes fools. Number 20, personal self-control in all situations. There are many of those listed in the book of Proverbs. For example, alcohol. And by extension for us today, that would include alcohol and drugs. Number 21, leadership character qualities. A lot is said about leadership character qualities. Spiritual gifts, natural talents, alertness to opportunities, decisive action, and so on. That all falls under that category 21. So I think it should be self-evident that a man must know these things before he can teach these things to his sons and to his daughters as he trains them for the kind of man that they will want to marry, the kind of man that they should avoid at all costs. How do they make decisions and differences? Because a girl usually functions on the basis of her heart. The father needs a trainer to say, look, when you see this kind of a guy coming, you need to flee because your heart may fall in love with him. He may be, you know, tall, dark, and handsome, and strong, and muscular, and, you know, wear some kind of special cologne that you really, really like. You've got to teach your girls. You've got to teach your girls. Because a man will move in under your radar if you're not careful. Happened to me. The father, for a father to teach these things, he must know them first. That requires diligent study and practical life application so that he can set the example for his sons to follow and for his daughters to know what they should look for. I recommend to you a practice that I have maintained ever since high school and much more consistently from college onward. I read at least one chapter of Proverbs and or a chapter from one or more of the other biblical wisdom books each day. That is Ecclesiastes, Job, James, First and Second Peter. Those are wisdom books. They're designed to teach you life principles. So let's begin with wisdom. 
Where and when does wisdom begin to take place in the life of a young person? Where does it start? What's a father supposed to teach his sons and daughters as the most important key issue? The first two verses I want to share with you today are going to be on my gravestone. They're the lead-off verses on the front. Proverbs 4, 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. And then immediately after that, Proverbs 9, 10. It explains to you where the beginning of wisdom is and what understanding is. Remember, wisdom's the principal thing. Get wisdom. With all you're getting, get understanding. Now it tells you where it is at. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Get wisdom, it's the principal thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When I was in college, I, I tracked that phrase, the fear of the Lord, all the way through scripture and came to the startling conclusion that in every case, it is reflecting back on the point of salvation. There is no wisdom outside of salvation. Worldly wisdom, yes, but God's wisdom, no. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You cannot get God's kind of wisdom. You can know facts, but you don't have wisdom. You can learn Bible verses, but you don't have wisdom until you start with the fear of the Lord. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then the last half of verse 10, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Remember it said, wisdom's a principal thing, get wisdom. With all that getting, get understanding. Then it tells you the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Of all the things that you can accumulate on earth, wisdom is the most important and valuable of them. Let me, let me read you just the next verse. This is not on my gravestone, but it's a good verse. Verse 11. For by me, that is by wisdom, thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. You want to live a long life? You don't want to die as a, a young person? You want to live a long life? For by me, wisdom, thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. So of all the things that you can accumulate on earth, wisdom is the most important. Wisdom is the most valuable of all of them. In fact, it's the foundation for accumulating all the other forms of earthly wealth. But more importantly, it's the foundation for accumulating heavenly treasure as well. You can gain earthly treasure and not get any heavenly treasure. And you can have no earthly treasure but have great riches laid up in heaven. Which would you prefer if you had a choice of one or the other? Also notice there is no wisdom if it does not start first with the fear of the Lord. Did you also notice that wisdom is firmly linked to understanding and that there is no real understanding without the knowledge of the holy? In other words, knowing God, fearing God, and understanding holiness and godly living is the foundation for all the rest of wisdom laid out in the book of Proverbs. And, by the way, in the rest of the Bible for that matter. And that wonderful promise of verse 11, For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. Now let's look at some of the specific things that a father should teach his sons in the next seven minutes. You can tell, we're never going to get all the way through the book of Proverbs. He does not start with sex. Isn't that interesting? As you look at the opening verses of chapter 1, he doesn't start with that because there are some things that tempt a boy before he ever reaches puberty. Solomon starts with the issue of making friends, who is good and who is bad, and the issue of covetousness. Those are two things that even little kids, I mean, I have seen my grandkids and I saw my kids, but that was longer ago, but most recently I've seen my, my grandchildren, you know, arguing over who gets to hold which toy. You know, that goes back to covetousness. It's mine. No, it's mine. It's mine. No, it's mine. Personal rights. Look at it. Verse 8 and following. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother. And then he goes in verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us look privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive as the grave and hold as those that go down to the pit. We shall all find, find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. We're going to go out and beat up people and steal their money. 
My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. Summary verse 19. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. So right out of the starting block, Solomon hits the issue of friendship and money. He has a great deal to say more on both of those subjects, but that's where he first draws the attention of his son. Wrong friends cause you to set the wrong goals in life, focusing on the temporal instead of on the eternal. I'm so thankful my dad hammered this into me when I was a kid. I'm thankful that making a lot of money has never been one of my goals in life, never. <laughs> you can see that. Solomon was the wisest, but he was also the wealthiest king of Israel because he applied the principles that he teaches in Proverbs to real life. But wealth was not his focus. He was not just eating sour grapes when he scorned to focus on grubbing for money. He had plenty of money, but he knew that money was not the source of joy, nor was it the source of life. In chapter 30, right before that marvelous fourth division of the book of Proverbs about the godly woman, in chapter 30 he says, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. You know, the New Testament picks up both of those principles. Give me neither poverty nor riches. That's the balanced view of money, because covetousness is idolatry. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Ephesians 5.5, 5, Paul says the same thing. For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, what a category to put that into, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And then that second thing that Solomon said, feed me with food convenient for me. Neither too much, which results in failure to trust God and in wasting our stewardship, or too little, which results in violating our other father-to-son principles, that is, avoiding the friendship with thieves that we just talked about in the opening verses of the book. Feed me with food convenient for me. Help me to learn to be content. That second point is called the principle of contentment. Paul writes that to his son in the faith. An extended section on that, as he writes to young Timothy, dealing with both of those principles taught by Solomon. 1 Timothy 6, chapter, five, uh, chapter 6, verse 5 and following. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Now here he's warning, just like Solomon warned his son in chapter 1, Paul does it, supposing that gain is godliness. And here's what he tells you to do, just like Solomon told his son to do. From such, withdraw thyself. That's the issue of friendship. Their focus is on money. They're not your friends. Hey, that's, that's a good bottom line. Their focus is on getting stuff, no matter how we get it. Hey, they're not your friends. Get out of there as fast as you can. From such, withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. That's your bottom line. For we brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment... Let us be there with content. <laughs> That's the same principle Solomon was teaching. Feed me with food convenient for me, neither too much nor too little. But they that will be rich, here's the focus of the world. Here's the focus of, I suspect, 90% of Christians in America today. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. That's the American Christian problem. For the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Why do you think Solomon started there in chapter 1 of Proverbs? Because the love of money is the root of all evil. You get into the wrong kind of friends, they'll put your focus on that, you'll end up killing somebody to get it. Which some, while some coveted after, there's covetousness, which is idolatry, we just heard that both in Colossians and in Ephesians, they have erred from the faith. It will turn you aside from, from sound doctrine. Your love of money is going to change your theology. 
They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Every time the stock market crashes, they weep and moan and wail and bewail. Every time, you know, something happens at the bank, oh, they fall apart at the seams. Every time their new BMW or Mercedes gets into a wreck, they don't know how to handle it. They've erred from the face, pierced themselves through with many sorrows, but thou, O man of God, today's Father's Day. I think every man in this place wants to be a man of God. Do you? I hope so. That's my desperate plea before the Lord. I want to be a man of God. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, judgment, justice, and equity. My, he's talking Proverbs 1. Godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Those are some of the other key issues that Solomon's discussing in the book of Proverbs. Look around you. How many Christian men teach their sons and their daughters, both by word and example? They're running after the almighty dollar is the chief aim of life. For them, earning money comes first. Getting in as much overtime and time and a half or double time is essential because there's money in it. Skipping church and prayer meeting is okay and is eh, secondary because after all, I've got to make more money, more money, more money, more money, more money, more money, more money. Oh, the money road. Oh, this is fun. You bounce right off the cliff. American society and Christians in America are focused on getting as much money as possible, as quickly as possible, regardless of the means, regardless of who you have to trample on to get it. So sadly, money has become the focus of the church and Christians in general. I hope you notice how the framework of chapter one related to friends also fits with many other specific areas that I listed. It not only fits number two, which is the wise use of money, but also fits with number 12, greed versus generosity. But one of the key areas where most men and boys don't see the connection until it is too late is number 17, lust versus love, the choosing of a wife. While it is obvious that friends will lead you into false financial principles, a covetous wife will destroy your ability to wisely use the resources and money that God has entrusted to you and for which you will give an account. You are the bottom line. The buck stops here. You can't do like Adam did and point to your wife and says, well, look at the wife you gave me. Adam was accountable, and you as a man are accountable. Your choice of a wife is very, very, very important. As you study Proverbs, you repeatedly see how every principle connects to every other one of the principles that we've listed for you. Years ago, I came to the conclusion that every theological point that you believe will affect every other theological point that you believe if you're consistent because they are interwoven. Everything that you truly believe will dramatically affect the way that you live. How a man lives is the proof of what he really believes. Regardless of how he may deny it with his mouth, how he lives is the proof of what he believes. Multiple generations of Christian fathers have failed to start where Solomon said they should start, teaching biblical friendship principles, because, you know, most relationships between boys and girls also end up starting with a friendship, and teaching biblical money principles, that money is a servant and a stewardship, not a master to be worshipped. We are owners of nothing. We are stewards of everything. Well, our time is up. We don't have time, obviously, to study every division, how it relates to those divisions, or every area of instruction, wisdom, justice, judgment, equity, how to apply these specific principles in each of these areas of instruction. I actually only got to page 6 of page 11 in my notes for today. But I was going to go through and give you verses that dealt with integrity, knowing and doing God's will, and all out of Proverbs. Wise use of skills, the issues related to diligent work, the wise use of time, the control of the tongue. Man, he has a lot on that. Accountability versus excuse making, life perspective, that is world view. Pride versus humility, a lot of verses on that. Greed versus generosity, anger versus forgiveness, sloth versus diligence, envy versus kindness, gluttony versus self-control, lust versus love. I did tell you that I was going to give you the verses that showed why Solomon was giving wisdom when he said, here's the wrong kind of woman, 
and here's the right kind of woman. He had a lot to say about it. He knew by bitter experience. He had 700 wives, 300 concubines. Pay attention to what he says about bad women. King Solomon, this is 1 Kings 11, verse 1. King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, which, by the way, was one of the morally filthiest nations of the ancient world. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses. He didn't get low-class women, he got princesses. Making alliances with these nations, because no king who's a father of a daughter is going to want to attack the nation where his daughter happens to be the wife of the king and she could get killed. And 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. And it goes on as you go all the way down through verse 11. And then finally, the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as you've done this, done as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statute which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. The wives were the reason that Rehoboam became a fool when he took over the kingdom from Solomon. Well, girls, be the right kind of a woman. Avoid the kind of woman that's described in Proverbs chapters 5, 6, and 7. Become a woman like the woman of Proverbs chapter 31, which I believe is a portrayal of Ruth, out of the book of Ruth, the great-grandmother of Solomon, we don't have time to talk about all the attitudes and motives, good and bad. Oh, a lot. Are the fools, the different kinds of fools in Proverbs, the personal self-control? I did mention alcohol, so I'll give you Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Don't think you can control it. That's stupid. There's so many, I can hold my liquor. I can take a, a social drink and it won't affect me. Oh, yes, it will. New Testament contrasts the control of alcoholic beverages with the control of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is when you're filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's the contrast. Because when you put in a little wine, it controls you a little. And you put in a little more, it controls you a little more. And you put in a little more, and it really going to control the way you talk and the way you walk around, the way you see things but be filled with the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit then controls the way you think and the way you speak and the way you act. No control from alcoholic beverages or drugs, things that people call painkillers, that then they get addicted to and they can't live without them and they don't want to admit that they're drug addicts. Dear people, that's in Proverbs. That's in the New Testament. Be filled with the Spirit. Well, men, do you know those things? Are you teaching them to your sons and daughters by the way you live? By your specific oral teaching? I know your children may not learn. They may not obey. They may fall, as did Rehoboam, Solomon's son. But it is still our obligation to teach these things to our children and then to live in a way that shows we really Believe it. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It is practical. And how many American Christians think there is no practical application in the Bible? Just a bunch of neat stories that maybe you can get some general ideas out of. And then they go on their merry way, living like the world around them. Failing to teach their children there's a living God to whom we must give an account someday. Father, I pray for the men of this church, for the men who are watching this broadcast. Father, I pray that you will make us into the men of God that you want us to be. Men who believe the truth and we prove we believe the truth by living the truth, by teaching, by training, by setting the example 
for our children and others to follow. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today.